Okay. Wow. What a start to the day. Okay. Let's hear it one more time for Kelly E. Parker, Laverne Baker, Hotep, and Lois Tony McClendon. Ladies, thank you for sharing your time and talents with us today. Good morning. And welcome to your We've Had Enough rally. My name is Brenda Green, and I'm with Choice, a small nonprofit that assists the uninsured to receive the access to the health care, reproductive, and maternal child health services they need and they deserve. And I've had enough. Have you had enough? Last November, the newly elected legislative leadership promised Pennsylvanians that they would forgo discussion of social issues to concentrate on the Commonwealth's economic concerns. Yet last January, the newly sworn in lawmakers chose to launch a full-scale attack on women's health with various bills aimed at restricting access to vital reproductive health care services. In the first six months of this year, Pennsylvania lawmakers spent 30 percent of their time at the Capitol working to saddle already adequately regulated health care facilities with unneeded restrictions that will hurt women, while at the same time working to prevent women from using their own health insurance to cover abortion care in the new health insurance exchange. <laughs> Meanwhile, Pennsylvania's unemployment rate surpassed 8%. 13.8% of our fellow citizens are without health insurance, and the state's poverty level remains well over 13%. We have a right to expect and demand more of our elected officials. In response to our lawmakers' misplaced priorities, over the summer, more than 1,500 women and men have joined together to say, we have had enough. Many of our 1,500 leaders are with us here, and we thank you for your commitment, your work, and your attendance. Many of the members of our movement could not be with us in person, but they're joining us right now in a virtual rally through Twitter and Facebook. We come together here. and remotely to say we have had enough. We've come from the Steel City and the City of Brotherly Love, from the Lehigh Valley and the Ligonier Valley, from communities all along the banks of the Delaware, Ohio, Susquehanna, and Juniata, from Arcadia College, the University of Pittsburgh, Temple, Penn State, Throughout the Laurel Highlands, the Co Poconos, and the Alleghenies, yes, we represent extremely diverse communities, but we have three things in common. We are healthcare consumers, we vote, and we have had enough. The number of abortion providers has been falling for the last three decades because of the constant unnecessary legal obstacles placed on physicians and clinics, combined with frequent harassment encountered by medical professionals for simply providing treatment and care to patients in need. Despite these barriers, our first speaker continues to provide the highest quality, compassionate care to his patients. It is with gratitude that I am pleased to introduce Dr. Parker. Good morning. I'm happy to be here with you. It took me a minute to get to the mic because I had to have the experience of standing in this powerful throng of people, so I'm so happy to be here today. My name is Dr. Willie J. Parker, and I'm a board-certified obstetrician-gynecologist licensed here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and I provide compassionate abortion services for women. And 
And while I'm delighted that you all have invited me to address this rally, I'm really not excited about the reason that we have to be here. We're here today because legislators misguided by the notion that they know what is best for women more than women do themselves have, have decided to abuse their regulatory authority by introducing bills that will actually hurt, hurt the very women that they claim to care about. SB 732, which would require freestanding abortion clinics to be regulated as ambulatory care centers, will not add one bit of safety to the abortion care that's already safe and legal. Now let me state the obvious, because I think it's important to why we're here. We are not aware, unaware of the actions of one single provider who preyed upon desperate women who were seeking abortion. And we know that, that the actions of that person was wrong and reprehensible, and that person should be held accountable. But let me tell you what we will not do. We will not allow misguided individuals in the legislature to exploit the actions of one rogue individual in Philadelphia to undermine the safety of all women in Pennsylvania. We will not do that. Anybody who's paying attention knows that abortion care is already heavily regulated and is extremely safe because it's covered by the Abortion Control Act. And not to mention the, the clinics that are affiliated with organizations like the National Abortion Federation and Planned Parenthood of America, they self-regulate and self-govern to make sure that the care that they provide is safe and of quality. And I think the real, thing, the real reason that I'm here, the, the privilege that gives me the opportunity to speak to you that, is that as a physician who provides abortions, I know firsthand that abortion care is safe in this state and in this country, and also as someone who's had the opportunity to travel abroad to countries where abortion care is not safe and where women are in danger because they don't have access to clinics, not because of them, I assure you that abortion care in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is safe. And what I can also tell you that if abortion care is to become dangerous in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it will be because of legislation like SB 732. Regulations that determine how many bathrooms there have to be, how many, how wide the halls have to be, what's the size of the utility room, and how big the freight elevator is, will not make one, less, one woman safer and will not prevent one death. The only thing that will, pro that will keep women safe is people who use evidence-based approach to abortion care. That's the only thing that's going to keep women safe. So today, I think we need to be clear about what SB 732 is. It is not a bill about health care and safety of women. These, this, bill, this is a bill about restricting access to abortion by creating cost prohibitive regulations for the already too few clinics that currently serve women in the Commonwealth. You know, somebody once said that there is no right way to do the wrong thing. I would submit to you that the use of regulatory authority to deny to women access to safe and necessary health care in the form of abortion is, an, is the search by members of the legislature for the right way to do the wrong thing. We, we, we all know that the only impact that this bill can have is to jeopardize the safety of women in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We already know from other states that when ambulatory care statutes have been imposed, all they do is they force perfectly safe abortion clinics to close. And we're convinced that the legislators who introduced this legislation, they know that, and that's why they're going this route.
So that's why I'm standing here today to put them on blast and to let them know that we know that you're, if you're really interested in the safety of women in the Commonwealth, you will stop this pernicious bill. Now, we know when similar legislation was enacted in Texas in 2004, uh, to, they've, they forced clinics, freestanding clinics to uh, conform to ambulatory care standards. And in Texas, they saw the 20 clinics that provided abortion service for women, many of whom had health conditions or that had pregnancies that were complicated by non-viable uh, pregnancies. We saw them go from having 20 clinics to two two clinics to support the needs of women with, with, with the problems that I just described. And my question to you for those women was, where did they go and what did they do? And if the same legislation is, hap is enacted here in Pennsylvania, our question will be, where would these women go and what will they do? Where would they go and what will they do? Already women have limited access to abortion and when I work in Philadelphia women drive for hours and miles to when they need abortion care to see me. The reality is women don't need less abortion care, they need more access to abortion care. So as I close, that's why I'm standing here with you today. Standing here proudly with the women of Pennsylvania, the people who love the women of Pennsylvania, and for those of us who provide compassionate health care service for them when they need it, I'm here to stand with you to say that we absolutely not, are not going to allow the legislature of Pennsylvania to jeopardize the lives of women in Pennsylvania. So as I stay, stand here, again, I say we will not allow the legislature to find the right way to do the wrong thing. We are not, and I repeat, we are not going to take this lying down, standing up, or in any other way. We're not going to stand by idly and watch women be made unsafe in, this, in Pennsylvania. So. As I close, I say that we insist, no, we demand that the legislature cease and desist in this effort to make women unsafe in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parker, for your remarks and thank you for the care you provide women. Okay. Before our next speaker, we want to acknowledge that not all Pennsylvania lawmakers are playing politics with women's health. A number of our legislators are here with us today, just as they were with us on the floor, and we'd like to acknowledge their presence and their support. Representative Dan Franco! Michelle Brownlee. Yeah. Representative Josh Shapiro. Yeah. Representative Robach. Yeah. And Representative Babette Josephs. We appreciate, oh, okay. And Representative Mike O'Brien. Okay. Are there any more legislators with us that are lost in the crowd? Do we miss anyone? Okay, as others join us, we'll keep you updated. We thank you and we won't forget. Okay. 
By limiting their options for care, the proposed bills will have a far-reaching impact on the well-being of countless women and girls. Let's welcome our next speaker, Sarah Trumbler gimple who has generously offered to provide us a personal perspective. Hello, my name is Sarah, and I chose to use my lawful right to have a safe and legal abortion in Pennsylvania. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and what led me to my decision. I was raised by parents with joint custody, split between northern Minnesota, land of lakes, Vikings, and you betcha, where I incidentally can't see Russia from my house. <laughs> and northeastern Pennsylvania, land of the Amish, the shoe fly, and an increasingly restrictive set of laws concerning women's health care. Most of my childhood was spent with my single mother in Minnesota. She was and is passionately pro-choice, pro-women liberal, who worked for the state legislature of Minnesota. I remember her always being vehemently pro-reproductive rights, marching on the state when the first Bush was in office with a sign that read, Bush, stay out of mine. <laughs> Growing up as a bi-coastal liberal in northern Minnesota was not particularly easy. I was definitely the odd woman out in many cases, but I knew what mattered. I grew up hearing the horror stories about experiencing unwanted pregnancies pre Roe versus Wade. A neighbor of ours had three children post-World War II and ended up pregnant. Knowing she could not afford another, she found someone who could perform an illegal abortion. She successfully terminated, but was infertile for the rest of her life. Another story of a young single woman was passed around when I was a kid. She spent weeks trying to find a doctor or anyone who could end her pregnancy. She finally found someone willing and had a so-called back alley abortion. This young woman bled to death waiting for a bus home. A lot of the details surrounding these stories were gray and unclear, with the stigma of shame and secrecy. What was always instilled in me was the idea of never again. Never again would we subject women to fear, uncertainty, and death. Never again would we, as a society for the people and of the people, leave an entire gender out of our protection. My mother taught me from the time I was young to stand up for the rights for my right to decide any and all medical decisions pertaining to my body. I have carried these stories and lessons with me and have been just as outspoken and dedicated to this belief. I always knew what my choices were. I became pregnant in late summer of 2009. I was a kitchen manager making $10 an hour with no health benefits. Living in a basement room, I was barely able to make the rent on. The economy had already taken a dive, and assistance programs were miles long in applicants. I had a barely running car and no college degree. I was not in a relationship with the male contributor to the pregnancy, nor did I want to be. I did not want to be a parent yet. I did not want to struggle to care for a child as a single parent. I did not want to only know a child in passing as I ran from one low-paying job to a second. When I decided the time was right for a child of my own, I wanted to want it, desperately and absolutely. The choice for me was simple. I still had dreams of a degree, of a career I was passionate about, and of someday being a mother, but not today. Today still had dreams for me. I finally decided to confirm my decision and went to purchase a pregnancy test, as well as one for a friend. Evidently, the day I chose to do this, there was a run on tests, because when I arrived at the store, only two lonely boxes remained, one with two and one with three tests. I intended to buy two tests for myself and my, friends, my friend, just to avoid any technical snafus, so I grabbed both. I found myself standing at the checkout, laying a total of five pregnancy tests out on the counter, avoiding eye contact with the visibly uncomfortable and underage teenage boy at the register. 
He finally looked me in the eye as he announced my total. I handed him the money, along with the explanation that I wanted to be really, really sure. <laughs> Once home, my friend went first, and we counted down the minutes, then cheered when it read, not pregnant. I left her doing a happy dance as I took my turn. I placed the test on the counter when I finished. The concept of a minute either drastically changes from one moment to the next, or I had one of the speed pass varieties. Because no sooner had I begun to wash my hands, and I had my answer. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to the AWC, because it definitely said pregnant. I went and stood on the stairs in shock. When asked the result, I simply threw the test in a Hail Mary pass to my friend, sat down, with all the gloom and finality of a door being slammed shut. Oh no, she said. I need to make a phone call, I replied. I chose the Allentown Women's Center for a number of reasons. The fact that I have a pers personal friendship with a staff member, the absolutely excellent, um, <laughs> sorry, the absolutely excellent reputation it has, and the fact that I live in the Valley. I was able to set up the appointment without hassle or guilt. I was made to feel welcome and validated. I cannot thank the doctor, nurse practitioner, and staff at the Allentown Women's Center enough for their professionalism, support, and warmth. I always felt safe and cared for, informed, and I never questioned the quality of my medical care, regardless of the size of the room I was in. The work that they and all of the providers do for us must continue. My life has been so full of blessings and opportunities since my procedure that I never doubted my decision. I have a job now that helps women post breast cancer and will be participating in a Susan G. Komen Walk for the Cure next month. I am planning on pursuing a business associates and then possibly a bachelor's in sociology. I'm in a committed, loving relationship with an amazing man. He knows all about my abortion and about me speaking here today. His only reaction, be safe and go get him, baby. I wanted to come here today and talk to you because you will so rarely find a woman willing to share openly about her abortion. The societal expectation of guilt and shame that is driven by certain groups in the United States drives us to silence. How would those people react if they knew the truth? That someone they loved had an abortion. Statistically, we know they have. We need to take this recent war on reproductive rights as an opportunity to be loud, to be heard, to say, we've had enough and we won't be silenced. I stand here with my shoulders straight, my head held high, and I proclaim, pro, proclaim proudly to you, I chose me. There are people in my life who do not know, and if they find out because of this rally today, I say, so be it. Those who loved and supported me yesterday will love and support me tomorrow. This is not the time to sit on the sidelines or to be apathetic. The right to control our own bodies and lives that was won 40 years ago is threatened more today than it has been since Roe v. Wade. We are here in support. We are support supporting all of those before, all of those now, and all of those to come. We are fighting in the name of every woman and girl who faced terror, fear, and persecution when the basic right to control our bodies was outlawed. We are fighting to keep reproductive rights for our daughters, our granddaughters, our friends, ourselves, our aunts, our co-workers. Yeah. 
We are fighting today to maintain control and choice of what happens within our own bodies. We are fighting to keep for our hopes, for our dreams, for our rights, and we are fighting for our very lives. Thank you. Okay, before our next speaker, we want to say thank you to Representative Ronald Waters for joining us. And thanks to Representative Bill DeWeese. Okay. Our next speaker is no stranger to many of us here today. She continues to awe us with the courage of her convictions, the strength of her faith, and her seemingly endless energy. Because of her resolve, we collegiately refer to her as Rev Bev. It is my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Dr. Beverly Dell, speaking on behalf of Pennsylvania Clergy for Choice. I stand here today representing an interfaith coalition of over 100 clergy, and we're not even six months uh, into our organization yet. We live and we minister in the communities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm here to say that legislators have been incredibly short-sighted, gullible, and ultimately irresponsible in the passage of Senate Bill 732 and its amendments. It would appear that those supporters of these bills have failed to count the devastating cost. The cost to women, the cost to women's health clinics, the cost to public health in Pennsylvania. Deliberately removing from the bill the requirement for a cost study shows you just how incredibly short-sighted, gullible, and irresponsible. <laughs> As religious professionals, we want to know what is the cost for the major renovation of facilities to comply with these excessive regulations. We want to know how long will these facilities be closed as changes are made. We want to know how many women will this negatively impact and where are they supposed to go. We want to know, and the women of the Commonwealth deserve to know, that as a direct result of this, how many facilities will fail to reopen because of the exorbitant price tag. We want to know what the price tag is for compliance that will undoubtedly be handed down to the women themselves. How many women will be able to afford to pay it if the costs double? Counting the cost is a moral act that must precede the passage of any bill. It did not happen. Abortion is a legal medical service and one that as clergy people we fully support. It is immoral in our opinion to make this legal health care option so expensive that it is only available to the privileged few who can afford it. <laughs> Pricing legal abortion out of the reach for the poor is a form of class warfare. <laughs> but as religious, religious professionals, we also want the legislators to tell us what is the human cost for women who no longer have access to safe and legal medical procedures? How many funerals for desperate women are the clergy going to have to perform for women, desperate women, who resort to illegal and unsafe abortions? How many women will delay care as they struggle to find the money and thus jeopardize their own lives? Did this legislature count the economic cost, the emotional drain, the family distress of more pregnancies that a woman or her family can sustain? No. No, it did not. There has been there has been and there will be no cost analysis, and that makes this an immoral, irresponsible legislative action. Ah. 
But it is not just that these bills are short-sighted. Legislators have also been, if not manipulative, then downright gullible. Using hype as an excuse, legislators sought a quick fix and failed to see the duplicity of those who pushed the bills. As clergy, we are rightly suspicious of those who misrepresent the purpose and the outcome of legislation. These bills have nothing to do with saving lives or protecting women's health. You can't do that by closing down clinics that provide necessary medical services or by increasing the cost. To think otherwise is incredibly naive, and this naivete is very dangerous for our communities. For politicians to pretend to understand and then to interfere in this matter that is only the prerogative of a woman and her doctor is irresponsible meddling. Further, democratically elected officials who are to maintain the separation of church and state have no business following the dictates of one religious viewpoint. When there are many of us religious perspectives that uphold abortion is a morally appropriate choice and sometimes a necessary moral choice. We've had enough. Pencil Pennsylvania deserves better than this. The women of the Commonwealth deserve better than this, and it's time to count the cost. That is the only way to make morally righteous decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Dell, for your support and your counsel. Now let's thank Representative Briggs and Senator Farnese. Before our next speaker, why don't we take a minute to acknowledge our compatriots from the western and northern regions of the Commonwealth, who in order to be here today, left several hours before sunrise. You know you've had enough when you set your alarm clock for 4 a.m. Our next speaker, Latasha Mays, is the founder and executive director of New Voices Pennsylvania, based in Pittsburgh. She's one of those dedicated people who left well before daybreak to be here with us, which is not surprising to any of us who know her, who have worked with her, and have learned from her. A native of West Philadelphia, she is a passionate reproductive justice activist and is deeply committed to the leadership of women of color in our movement. Let's welcome Latasha Mays. Let me start by saying that 4 a.m. is not a joke. <laughs> I'm so glad to be in the service of reproductive justice, make some noise for reproductive justice. We, we are going out on the front lines into the next frontier of reproductive freedom. And here with me today are my sisters from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And also, my sisters who represent our movement from around the country, who are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, are here via phone today. Can we make some noise for them as well? And a special shout out to uh, Becca Zayla Umguni. She is our, our program director. She could not be here today because she is there. Can we make some noise for her as well? And so today is our fearless call to action for human rights and reproductive justice for all women in Pennsylvania. 
On behalf of all those we serve across the state, I bring you greetings, I bring you peace, and I bring you blessings from New Voices Pennsylvania, Women of Color for Reproductive Justice. And you know what? You know what? We've had enough. We've had enough. And for the last seven years, we have been building a movement that is based on the belief that we all get to control all choices about our bodies, about our sexuality, about our gender, about our work, and about our reproduction. Are you with me? Yeah. Reproductive, reproductive justice is our movement. Reproductive justice is our theory of change for where we stand today in society. Reproductive justice is our everyday practice so that we can affirm who we are and all the choices we make and all the experiences that we have. And so we are fiercely committed to elevating the voices of women of color. We want to preserve our human right to decide if and when we will have children, if and when we won't have children, and how to parent the children that we already have. And so we invest our time, our love, our labor. We, we, we struggle, we face challenges, but we are here today still standing because guess what? We've had enough. 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 You all did that right on cue. <laughs> so as I stand before you today, I bring with me the leadership, our membership, and our supporters of all colors and all genders. And they say from the three rivers of Pittsburgh to the northern tier, to the Susquehanna Valley, and to that Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, we've had enough. There is something to be said when a state legislature begins the year trying to create a dangerous policy that will prevent women from using their own private health insurance to cover abortion and continues through its session to flagrantly try to eliminate access to safe, legal abortion and providers. These actions indicate to us that the, the, that the health and women's lives, they hang in the balance with one vote, with one sponsor, with one stroke of a pen. It is clear to us that political agenda trumps all common sense, all common sense, And this is addressed to our wayward and misguided state legislatures. But we know who you are. <laughs> Evidently, there is more concern about, there, is, there needs to be more concern about gender-based and state-sanctioned oppression of a whole class of people that represent more than half of the population, as opposed to the real social and economic needs and concerns of all Pennsylvanians. Yeah. But how soon do our legislators forget that it's the community organizers, and it's the social activists, and it's the community leaders who, at the grassroots level who have the power each and every election. It is up to us to remind them of this and their responsibility to us, those they represent. Since each and every decision that they make about a woman's life affects all Pennsylvanians. Woo! 
And so we are here to peti petition our government for grievances and to say what? We We've had, had enough. To say what? We've had enough. I don't think they can hear you. To say what? And so on behalf of the women of color we serve, we're here to say that we've definitely had enough. We've, we've had enough for the past 500 years, as Begazela has said, and we're not taking it anymore. It is time to move on from trying to control our human dignity and our reproductive destiny. Move on, because we're not taking it anymore. And you know what? We've had enough of deceptive legislation like Senate Bill 732 that poses to save women's lives while jeopardizing women's lives in reality. And women of color say that it's not going down not on our watch. And as I close, I want to say to you that it is our bodies, our sexuality, our gender, our work, and our reproduction. We need you to trust black women. We need you to remember that women's rights are human rights. We need you to know that reproductive justice equals freedom. And we are women of color for reproductive justice, and we've had enough. We've had enough. We've had enough. Say it with me. We've had enough. We've had enough. We've had enough. We've had enough. Thank you. Okay. Are there some wicked acoustics in here or what? Thank you, Latasha, for your inspirational words, but especially thank you for mentoring the next generation of women leaders in our movement. And we also want to send out a big thank you to Representative Pam Delisio. As the founder and president of the Feminist Majority Foundation, National Clinic Access Project, and twice national president of NOW, our final speaker needs no introduction. But I'm going to go ahead because I want to be able to say that the day that Pennsylvania voters had enough of politicians putting politics above women's health, I was there to introduce one of the architects of the modern drive for women's equality. A political analyst, a strategist, and a grassroots organizer extraordinaire, Eleanor Smear has led has led efforts to the economic, political, and social equality and empowerment of women worldwide for over three decades. Let's welcome Ellie. Yeah. Thank you. much for that wonderful introduction, but you left one thing out of my bio that I cannot forget. I'm very proud to have been the founding president of Pennsylvania Now. When Joanne Tossi Vasey asked me to come up here, the president, the current president of Pennsylvania now, for the I Had Enough rally, I wanted to come because I've had enough not only here in Pennsylvania, but state after state after state. But before I 
get on to the national message, I want to thank some brave and courageous leaders that come right from Pennsylvania. I want to thank Carol Tracy and the Women's Law Project. That I want to thank Kate Michaelman, who comes from Gettysburg, who, who led the national NARAL for years and years. Thank you, Kate, for all you've done. Yes, we are very proud here in Pennsylvania that we have produced national leaders in this fight for women's rights. And I have to tell you, I have been in this state capitol fighting for legal abortion and family planning. I hate to tell you how many years, but it's well over 40. In 2010, we were told by people who were running for office that they were going to get down to business and deal with the economy. We were told that in 2008. But what do they do when they get into office in the United States Congress? One bill after another to limit the rights of women to reproductive justice. That's what they did in the United States House. One bill after another. And what did they do? They held up the new health care reform law. What about abortion rights for one year? While they played with women's rights, tried to oppress us in every way, they allowed our economy to get worse and worse and worse. Yes. Yes, we've had enough, but they don't finish there. This rogue political movement, they call it a party, <laughs> sort of, it's not a pea party that I know much about, but anyway, they introduced in state after state after state laws to restrict access to abortion and birth control. Let us not forget this is a war not only against abortion, but access to birth control. I don't want to be partisan, but we're Republicans. We're in the majority in state after state after state. They introduced over 900 pieces of legislation to restrict a woman's fundamental rights. 900 pieces. And they passed over 80 bills in many states, 19 states, to restrict abortion rights. Yes, Pennsylvania isn't alone, and this is not about one case. This is about a nationwide movement to restrict access. That's why we're calling it the War on Women, and we are intent to stop that war right here in Pennsylvania. As, and I think it's possible because as the neighbor as your neighboring state of New Jersey literally struck all family planning funding out of its its state budget 100 percent you're hearing that Governor Christie is this great moderate forget it not on women's rights he's not a moderate he vetoed any efforts to restore family planning. 100% cut. And you know those family planning bills are for low income and poor women. Yes, this is a class warfare on war, class warfare on middle class and low income women. to say, because of your movements, Pennsylvania did not cut family planning this year. And I think we can and must stop SB 732. We've had enough. 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 We've had en
I just came from Virginia, where we have just not only passed a bill that requires first try abortions and the abortion pill, a pill, to be now only in clinics that can meet hospital-like standards. And the board, they call themselves the Board of Health, but right now it is really the Board of Oppression in Virginia, has passed, and, and it's political oppression. This has nothing to do with health care. Uh, but anyway, they passed regulations just this last, uh, a couple weeks ago, that require uh, that medical examiners can enter a clinic at any time and interview the patients. Do women have no right of privacy under our Constitution? When are we going to not only have enough, but when are we going to start sitting in in these places and saying, you don't not only represent us, we want equal rights in these legislative bodies. We want more representation of women. If there were 50% women in the state legislatures and in Congress, this nonsense would stop. And so we've had enough, and I believe they have pushed us too far. We didn't ask for this fight. We wanted to turn to economic issues, but they have thrown down the gauntlet, and we're not going to forget who's been with us and who's against us. Women's lives and girls' lives are at stake. When I look at the map of Pennsylvania, and I have driven every inch of this state fighting for women's rights in my day here, and I was raised in Erie, Pennsylvania. And shout out for Erie. And I lived many years in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But when I look at a map, we shouldn't be here figuring out how to close down clinics for women. We should be sitting here figuring out how to open low-cost, affordable clinics for women. abortion reproductive health clinic in Erie County. And if you look at a map, there isn't clinics in most of the counties of Pennsylvania. So what is the purpose of this? To shut down even more clinics. So women don't have access not only to low-cost family planning, but to low-cost STI, uh, sexually transmitted infections testing, when we have nearly, I think, 11 STIs now of epi epidemic proportions in our country, where they do not have access to low-cost gynecological treatment or exams, this is the exact wrong way to go. And we have got to turn it around. And so we've just begun to fight, even though we've been at it 40 years. We're going to stop SB 732 here, and we're going to carry it on in state after state until victory is ours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie, for those inspirational words and for the national pers um, perspective. Um, we do want to point out that on very short notice, she rearranged her schedule to be here with us today because of her commitment to this issue and because of the very real threat we face in the Commonwealth. Okay, we're almost done. I just have a couple housekeeping items and then we're going to break. Um, thank you for attending. But it's really vital as we wrap up that we remember today's rally is not a culminating event. It is a beginning. The women and girls of Pennsylvania need us. 
and there are many ways for you to stay involved. Some of you will be joining us on legislative office visits this afternoon. For those of you that are not, we have other activities that you can help us with. Downstairs in the East Wing Rotunda, you'll find supplies and talking points and volunteers to assist you to draft much desperately needed letters to legislators and your local newspapers. You can fill out a postcard that we will ensure is delivered to your legislator. You can take a picture with your sign or film a video explaining why you've had enough that could for possible use on our website. Please make sure you sign your photo release form. You can join the virtual movement and tweet and post on Facebook using the hashtag we've had enough. You can sign up to help us with our blog postings, and we welcome your ideas for future public education events. Stop downstairs, share your thoughts, and find out, find out how and where we need you. We can stop this. When we leave the Capitol today, it is vital that we stay committed and involved. There are a number of things you, do, you can do to keep our movement focused and functioning. Stay up to date on the latest information and volunteer opportunities through our website, www.we'vehadenoughpa.org. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and continue to educate your family, your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, your colleagues, elected officials, community leaders. Okay. Okay. We also want to remind the press corps that's here today, please stop by our table. Um, we have press packets and we also have um, interview availability with some of the spokesmen from our many organizations. Um, one last thank you to Representative Mark Cohen. And Representative Tony Payton. A group of tireless individuals from two coalitions representing 35 organizations from across the state plan today's rally. They are too numerous to name, but you know who you are, and we know you are exhausted. So we simply say thank you. Additionally, several organizations provided very generous financial assistance for the buses. Thank you to the ACLU of Pennsylvania, the Allentown Women's Center, Association of Women in Communications, the National Council of Jewish Women, Planned Parenthood, Women and Girls Foundation, and the Women's Law Project. Last but not least, before we close, we want to thank our legislative allies who continue to fight these dangerous and unnecessary bills. Your, you are the voice of reason in the House and the Senate, and we appreciate your votes, and we will remember. Are there any legislators here that we did not mention? Okay. Okay. Today's rally and the work yet to come is our line in the sand. We've had enough. It stops here and now. We can make this happen. We have to. Take us out.